And we want to just do our best now to try to bring this to a close, that we can all learn something other together. My main objective is in presented this, presenting this message is that as Christians, we can take a look at the religious world, the reactions, the condition, the attitude. It's all out there. And somewhere in every one of these parables, it's pointing to certain, we will say, environments, conditions that all of this creates. The church world don't realize the hour they live in. But the church world is passing through an interval of spiritual judgment. It's not announced. But the ultimatum is, through the years of time pertaining to this living generation, somewhere they heard something, somewhere they saw something, somewhere they've dealt, been dealt with by the Spirit of God on an individual basis, and they made a choice that began to cause them to fit into one of these parabolic circumstances. Now, <clears throat> I don't need to read the 25th chapter tonight in this first sitting. It's a parable. But notice, the word that Jesus speaks to about. It's following his discourse to the disciples when they ask him a question. What will be the sign of thy coming? The end of the world and the fulfillment of all of these things that he had just said. The first thing he said, take heed that no man deceive you. He comes all down to the ages, gives you all the things that's going on. And when he said, distress of nations, look what's going on in Central Africa tonight. In Bosnia, if that is a distress of nations, caught up in a turmoil, chaotic, devastating, millions of those people will be buried in an unmarked grave. All because of a bunch of mad politicians. And watch, brothers and sisters, right when we think it's all over there, it'll suddenly strike in somewhere else. Because it shows there are nations in political, economic, and social distress. There seems to be no remedy. All of these are signs of the end time. Now then, as Jesus is building the picture to this hour, then his thought jumps to the parable. Then is a future tense. And when he said then, that put it right now shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to. Now when we read it in its entirety, we're reading a picture of people going out somewhere to a geographical spot where there's going to be a gathering together of a host of people for the event of a wedding. But we know, brothers and sisters, you have to transpose all of that into a spiritual application because it goes to show, brothers and sisters, that Christians the world over down through the ages, as we come to this very hour of time, they remain to live in their geographical spot right where they was when they were sinners and many times lived their lifetime there. So all of these positions and things, we have to transpose it to some kind of a spiritual application. We notice here, it was while they all began to slumber and sleep that brings us into the hour when the Laodicean age begins to get well in motion. All of a sudden, there was, and at midnight, there was a cry made. That's in verse 6. Now, people will read that cry and never associate it with anything that's of importance. But we do know that the cry in verse 6 has to be the same 
shout that Paul was talking about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which remain alive unto that hour shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. When we line all of these scriptures up, we can well see the same man in the parable that was making a cry to the age of Laodicea, Jesus is coming, let's get back to the word. That became a cry, that became a shout. Let's wake up and get ourselves ready because the wedding is to be. And how true, brothers and sisters, Brother Branham's message woke up a church world of people, especially from the denominational standpoint, that has now went, had went sound asleep, and it didn't wake up the systems. We can say, these are the beds wherein the masses went to sleep and never woke up. But there within that, there was a people destined to be awakened, to the point of realizing something has been said, something's going on. Now then, we can see this parable shows that there is an interval of time that follows the cry. Too long people interpreted it that as quick as those that woke up, they went in the rapture. Brothers and sisters, the rapture was not yet even thought of. It goes to show from the initial cry and the awakening, there was a time factor that lay over the age for a particular element of people that is to be, we will say, partakers of the age of time. And that's why I said in 1963, when we might say God used his man to complete the overall message by bringing the revelation of the six seals some of the young people were not even born. But in that time factor, it goes to show there was young people that was not yet born that are destined to be born. And in this time factor, while there is a going in of the overall picture of the wise, the young, young are born and they too play their part in the going in. Now somewhere in this parable, as the, we will say we were in the time factor, while some are going in, what were they going into? A building? No. They were going into a revelation. That revelation is how the Lord Jesus Christ is quickened and made alive to the bride, the predestined children of God. It's not that they see him in the physical but they see him in the image of his personality, his character, and the objective that God has ordained. You see it all from the standpoint of the spirit, not from the flesh. While they were going into that revelation, making up the body of Christ, the true body, becoming the true church of the living God, there were other people then that were the foolish they were told to go down that buy and sell out into the marketplace. That's figurative. On out there in the denominational church world where all of these religious evangelical programs are going on. And brothers and sisters, since the 60s, that's exactly what's been the making. Every one of those systems produced a category of preachers and evangelists definitely that took their position in the marketplace. In the world religious structure, and they have built and put together the biggest monstrosity of a wholesale sellout of the excess. It's sort of like these grocery stores today. You pick up the paper, coupons this and coupons that. Well, I don't know that they've got that low yet in passing out coupons, but brother, some of the other gimmicks they put on to draw a crowd, they've just about stooped that low. Now, some words it portrays that just before there is then the rapture, it shows the wise in this revelation are now beginning to near approach 
the point of time of completeness. Somehow or other, something begins to awaken the foolish. They begin to inquire. They begin to too one into this. But from within, the Lord seems to speak to them. I don't know you. Now, brothers and sisters, in the natural, those words are never uttered. But it's how the Spirit applies rejection. And that spirit of rejection will have an effect on those people. It shows the door of revelation is closed. They could sit in your midst. They say, well, explain this. And you could set up all night and explain the best you could. But if that spirit of God that does the rejection has not absolutely given them the ability and imparted unto them the ability to see what you're talking about, it's just the same. It has the same effect as if he said, it's over. He shuts the door and all your words are as words spoken to the air. That's how we have to look at it. And I have to believe we are approaching near the end of what that parable is all about. Now then, when we go into this next parable, Jesus picks up again. And this is what I read last Sunday. For the kingdom of heaven, now he goes back in this to the apostolic beginning. As a man traveling into a far country. Well, we know, brothers and sisters, this is all Jesus' way of telling the church what's going to happen after he finishes his ministry and he's ready to be taken to glory, to be in the presence of the Father. He's going to do just as this natural man who calls his servants. That in his absence, they are to pick up and continue on with whatever he was doing. That's what it all implies. So he gave to one according to his ability. Five talents, another two, and to another one. Now at this point, brothers and sisters, we've got to realize this is how it was in the initial beginning of the church. How did this man distribute these talents? In the natural, we would see a man talking to individual men. But in the spiritual, brothers and sisters, that's not even carried out until we read in Ephesians 4. Let's turn to it. We will notice, brothers and sisters, when Jesus spoke these parables, somewhere along the way, the apostles, they see how certain things are applied in the spiritual application. That's why when we can look in the epistles, we'll see how to understand the application. We will tra say transposing it from the natural to the spiritual. When the Apostle Paul is writing here to the Ephesians, we can see here, starting in verse 7, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he says when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Well, when he ascended up on high, when was that? Well, we go back, brothers and sisters, in the book of Acts, and we can see the disciples following Jesus over on the Mount of Olives. You pick it up in the last parts of Luke and in the first parts of Acts. And as they followed Jesus over there, there's where Jesus told them, Go ye into Jerusalem and tarry and wait till you be endued with a power from on high. Why? Because from that position, Jesus ascended into heaven. That's when the man in the parable 
took his journey into a far country. That's how we understand the application of it. Now, while they're on the mountain, just before Jesus began to lift up, he never told them, now you go into Jerusalem, and I'm going to pour out gifts on you. He never said a thing like that, did he? He just said, until you be endued with power. So he was taken up from their midst, never to be seen in the flesh no more. But yet, it is he, according to the parable, that is definitely going to do this distribution, fulfilling what these talents are. So therefore, we take up Paul's revelation, and we read here then, that he is given then for, therefore unto every person in the church grace according to the, the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now if he led captivity captive, then who was it that he took? That's why Paul says, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? That's when he died. On the cross, then his spirit went down into the lower parts of the earth. And there is where, brothers and sisters, with now the invested authority from the Heavenly Father, he unlocks, brothers and sisters, that prison door of death that has held those saintly people there from way back in the days of Adam's hour, waiting for that day of the redemptive price to be paid, wherein God would unlock and let them prisoners out of there, out of hell, yet that region of paradise. And that's why, brothers and sisters, we pick it up then. On the day that that earthquake came and Jesus came forth from the tomb, never to die no more, also many of them that slept in the graves came forth and appeared in the streets of Jerusalem. That's why, brothers and sisters, we have to believe and realize there was an element of the dead that had died from Adam's hour right up unto the hour of Christ, that what he has accomplished this redemptive work, that's when he overcame hell by the fact he went there and he preached to those imprisoned spirits, but he took the righteous out of there and there is no longer a place called paradise in hell at all. When he ascended up then, brothers and sisters, he tucked them to glory to be with God through, through this period of time. Leaving only in hell the region of the damned, the doomed, the wicked. That's the portion of hell that yet is not done away. So, as we read here, when he ascended upon high, he took the redeemed spirits of the Old Testament saints. And as he took them to glory, brothers and sisters, now that he ascended, what is it but that he has descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended, went up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things, filling all things, meaning the church, which is his body. And he gave apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers. Therefore, brothers and sisters, when we connect this, this is Paul's teaching. When we connect this with 1 Corinthians 12, and see how Paul laid it out there. On the day of Pentecost then, when they're there with the knowledge that Jesus has said, tarry until you be endued with power from on high. Now, the man that took the far journey, it's Christ gone to glory to intercede in the presence of the Father, fulfilling the redemptive work, intercessory work in that behalf. Here's how the distribution of these things, the things that God had invested in Christ, Here's where that now is going to be invested in the church. So just as there were gifts, nine of them, so is their callings. And that's why we see it described like this. We can say that on the day of Pentecost, everything that Christ was here in the literal person that he was and what God exemplified in and through him, now it's invested in the church. And as that first stage started, we can say this, we're not looking at mixed kinds of Christian. We're looking at predestined children of God. 
And we can say this. We were not looking at people who would receive a gift and then go bury it. Every person that received a gift went right out and invested that. That in the end, the Lord and His purpose is all fulfilled and He is glorified. Keep in mind, brothers and sisters, when we look at predestination, the foreknowledge of God, God knew exactly how to begin to apply His plan and fulfill His purpose in the church. It's not until we come to the second century to begin, begin to see that adverse spirit bringing in the tares. Yes, they're coming in on the same message that calls the others. But somewhere as this type of seed begins to be interjected into the church, here is where we will say two spirits begin to run parallel, yet opposite of purpose. And yet it was not to be separated, not to be distinguished, how different it might be, leave it alone. That's why, brothers and sisters, the parable now of the talents is pointing to the end time. For all of this has to come to some kind or through some kind of a judgment state. So when we see here, here is the one that received one talent. And yet because he says these things, he goes out and buries him. Now brothers and sisters, keep in mind, we're looking at the 20th century. We're looking at a living generation of people in the church world as a whole, how the Spirit of God has dealt and worked in their lives, in their midst, with them, and all of this picture is being fulfilled right to the very night. Because this is the hour when it is finally over. Everything that's in those parables will have been fulfilled. By the time we come to the hour, that the wise and the faithful have come to whatever hour of time that was, the question mark for the rapture, they are going to be perfect. They're going to be the ones that literally fulfill the good, the wise, the faithful that is described in every one of these parables for the sake of illustration. It's all spoken in a mysterious way. That's why down through time, very few understood the meaning. But it's right here in the end. We are given the insight what this spiritual judgment is produced. It's just, brothers and sisters, it's just like the seals. Them first four seals, them four horse riders, look at the church world. They're still looking for them to ride. Jehovah Witness, Seventh-day Adventists. Look at Billy Graham, the book he wrote. They all see them four horses riding in tribulation. But when the messenger to the age brought the revelation, it let a few people in this religious world turn their eyes in the other direction. That's, that's not what it's pointing to. They've already ridden. And they who heard the revelation of those four horsemen were the witness of the fact that the fifth seal has already been implied as far as part A. Because World War II produced the first category of those Jewish saints. And we've been passing through a little short interval of time, waiting till the next bunch. That's the little season. And do you think any of that denominational world understands that? Not one bit. So brothers and sisters, if they didn't understand the revelation of the seals, they don't see themselves in these parables when they are brought to the culminating hour and there's a spiritual judgment going on in this world and what's affecting them. Now let's just look at the hour. We'll say there's people in this earth God has dealt with. He has invested talents. At the same time, He has invested callings. Cause the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. I think you'll see it's more easier to see now that when you have an element of men and an element of people in which God through the past number of years since this man's message has hit the earth 
some have been awakened to the reality they are to be part of God's true church. They see the picture that that church has got to be a true supernatural church. That means a body of people collectively, the world over, in which the Holy Ghost has invested in them those same attributes and manifestations that God had placed in the person of His Son. Also, the same church in its beginning as it had them callings, gifted offices of ministries. Here in the last days, God has so moved by His Spirit to give many, many men an opportunity to see the kind of a ministry He wants for the last hour of time to finish up the picture. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, many have thought they saw the picture, started out only somewhere along the line to run into some kind of a stump or an opposition, and they couldn't stand the pressure. They began to see the possibility, I'm going to lose all my friends. Oh, what a terrible hour. I can't stand it. And after they've considered the whole thing, the cost of it, they begin to say, I just don't believe this is the way. There's got to be an easier way. So as they look around, sooner or later they begin to find something else to let themselves be brought into. As I look back at the hour when Brother Branham preached the church ages, you don't know the numbers of people that moved in, wanted to move in this area from New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, and that area. Many did. Many were saying, I just can't wait till God manifests whatever gift He has for me. Because it is a truth, brothers and sisters. There were gifts begin to make their appearance and manifestation in the area at that time. This seemed to be a drawing factor for many. Sure, gifts were still going on out there, we will say, in the de deliverance circles. What we call, brothers and sisters, this overall revival that's going on out there today, the charismatic. They were still having, we will say, a certain amount a manifestation of the same out there. But the point of it is, brothers and sisters, watch the parallel. Watch how this parable begins to zero into the hour. The message that Brother Branham brought in 1963, he stressed the church to have the gifts and the five office callings of the ministry. I'll never forget when the service was over and were dismissed to have a period of time to talk, to communicate. Maybe a little later after the service, somewhere in a restaurant, or as we come back the next night, the expectancy that people had within their heart, they somehow or other felt like they were standing at the threshold of something great. And brother... I can think of the many that will say, I can't wait till that hour. Oh, my brothers and sisters, only three years later at the end of 1963, as Brother Branham saw the necessity to reach out and touch a situation to correct. When church order was made, look what carnal people did. They interpreted this thing completely to the opposite end of what 1960 they had saw. And when that church order was put in, many began to absolutely react exactly what this man who buried the talent. The words he said, I know that he strolls. Let's I forget how it's worded, but you can read it later. They made excuses over the fact that because the master has distributed like this and gone, they've done the work, he comes back and does the reaping, and therefore somehow or other look at it, he's a hard man. 
That's what all is said to bring out the fact of the matter. But keep in mind, those words are never said. Those are not the natural words that affect people. But those words produce a condition in the natural. And then when you take the results of that condition and apply it to the spiritual side, you see people who begin to say, up to a certain time they was praying for this. They was praying for that. They was praying to see this. And they was praying to move into that. Now then, oh my, if it's going to be this hard, if it's going to be this straight, I don't know whether it's worth it to prophesy. I don't know whether I want to speak in tongues. I don't know whether I want to pray to interpret. Or I might make too many mistakes. I can say this, brothers and sisters. There were people sitting, playing tapes, listening to these things. When church order came, that became a legal excuse. Stop praying for gifts. Stop praying to interpret. Stop praying for anything like this. Because it's all over. From that hour of time, brothers and sisters, many begin to say, we've got the perfect. They begin to take that passage of Scripture. We know this. We prophesy in part. We do certain things in part. But that which is perfect has come. Then the imparts shall be done away. They begin to say, we done got the perfect. Therefore, we pass beyond the gift. Brothers and sisters, look. Gifts, in a minimum sense of the word, was still out there in the charismatic, the Pentecostal realm. You follow me? But that bunch of people was not being affected by a divine revelation at all pertaining to the bride. That element of people is being used to produce an effect that will affect other types of people, basically tares and foolish virgins. And this is why, brothers and sisters, when church order came, it hit this movement and it was that we might say it was entwining to this message and it began to absolutely touch the hearts of the type of people that's likened to that man of the one talent. I can't pay the price. I can't afford to risk my reputation. So I'm going to stop praying for this or I'm going to stop praying for that and I'll just bury the whole thing and say it's better to do nothing than to go out here and make a mistake and have to be corrected on it, over it. Look what is produced in this movement. That's exactly why faith assembly has been looked upon, brothers and sisters, as a church, not in the message. Let me say this. In the way they have interpreted the man, no, we're not. But in the way, brothers and sisters, I believe God allowed us to hear the man that we are. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, that's exactly why we're here. That's why we're known throughout the whole entire world now. We are a people. We have so something. And God has done something inside of us. It don't make us perfect yet. But at least it's given us a picture to what we're looking at. And God's grace has along the way helped us to stand against the pressures of the hour. Keeping our eyes on something that is yet ahead. And think of it, brothers and sisters, as this message has went out there in the religious world and certain preachers have gotten a hold of it. Preachers with callings. Here's how that spirit begins to affect those with callings. For if it can affect those, we will say that potentially had an opportunity to accept the manifestation of gifts eventually in their lives, likewise in that of callings. It's out there. And brothers and sisters, as they begin to hear about a tape, they begin to hear about a book, they begin to read, they begin to listen. Oh, at first they're enthused. But after a while, if they feel like they can see something in this message that might profit them, that they can gain some kind of recognition personally for themselves, it isn't long they've got a little revelation how they're going to fulfill such and such in the fivefold ministry. About the time they're ready, we will say, to announce, I'm this or I'm that, it isn't long you begin to hear of a revelation they're coming forth with, 
And that revelation that you hear coming out of them lips, when it falls on the ears of them that are really God's children, they know exactly how to listen to it. And as they listen to it, it don't sound just quite like it should. Now I'm saying this tonight, brothers and sisters, to acquaint you with the fact too long many people have just absolutely the minute somebody comes along that's got a wonderful ability to teach certain things that sounds so sweet. He's able to pull every element together and paint such a beautiful picture. It's easy for you and me to just suddenly, oh, in a wonderful. That was wonderful. That was glorious. Hallelujah. I'm going to go with him. That many times I was all of our personal reactions. But John in 90 AD, having seen these conditions, how they went on there in the closing hours of the first age, an old man that has seen so many people injured and even destroyed in the faith by this devilish tactic. What do we hear him saying in the little epistles of John? Dearly beloved, believe not every spirit, but try them. So faith assembly, it's wonderful to hear a person that's got a unique quality, ability to take things of Scripture, pull together thoughts that portray certain elements of a beautiful revelation. Oh, brother, how glorious it sounds, and it can be. But if we do as John said, but try them, we don't have to set her all tightened up we can sit there with our ears open, but knowing what you see because how the Lord has already taught you. If any man's got a revelation of truth, then what he's saying so beautifully isn't going to start taking something other away from you to make room for his. It's going to add to. Most of the time, to some it's just God's way of using another person and giving him an opportunity by the unique way he can say it. It causes someone to understand it that maybe couldn't understand it the way I brought it out. That's why, brothers and sisters, when the Lord said in the church, there's five definite callings. And every man has that calling invested in him based on his ability to have the Word of God, a revelation in the true makeup of it, and in the end results, you cannot help but see the Lord Jesus Christ. But, oh, brother, how many times these special characters, and all oh, they sound so unique. Somewhere along the line, they reserved inside of them something, and that's the punchline because they've learned that by wise tactic, studying what's in front of them, they know exactly how to lay it out there. And if you and I aren't sitting there listening carefully, and we're just sitting there like a little bird in the net with our mouth wide open, nine times out of ten brothers and sisters, when you think you're getting a worm, he's giving you a rock, and you've done swallowed it. And then we begin to complain. I say that, brothers and sisters, with all honestness and sincerity. That's going on in this very hour. Don't you ever go to sleep and think for one minute that everybody that's coming down the road that's had, we will say, us insight to this message of truth we've had for these number of years and has got a unique way to explain it, don't you ever think for once that every one of them is teaching it to glorify God. Amen. There's some out there, oh yes, they have a beautiful picture of the most of it. But somewhere along the line, there's something
something they've reserved for themselves because they're going to use that truth. They have a personal, self-made ego objective. And that's why Satan can use a man like that. You take a man that we can say, intellectually, he's not very smart. And spiritually, he just doesn't have a capability of explaining a lot of things. Keep in mind, brothers and sisters, that's a poor character for the devil to use. Because the average person can see through his ignorance, not because that means you diminish his, his person, it just means he don't have the, the ability. But when Jesus mentioned in 24, Matthew 24 and verses 24, that in the last day, then shall appear false Christ and false prophets, and shall do great signs and wonders, in so much that if it were possible, they will deceive the charismatic. No, no. They're already deceived. That's tares out there. Doing exactly what the parable brings out. But deceive the very elect if it was possible. And we can say this they complete preaching the supernatural. They believe, brothers and sisters, in the manifestation of the Spirit. And they can testify of the many things God has done through them and with them. That's all so true. So has He done that out there. And you see what follows it. They follow that because that's all they want. But we know this. The bride wants more than that. The bride wants truth. So that kind of a character comes with, we will say, 98% truth. Believing in the supernatural as a justifiable vindication, this man has to be of God. And he don't have to be of God at all. He's just another one of them characters coming down the road. He's not that kind of a terror. He's a high class terror. Designed, brothers and sisters, to do in your and my hour what that first bunch did back there as the first age was closing out when Paul could say, and as John said, even now there are many Antichrist. Now, brothers and sisters, as we analyze then this parable of the talents, the man, the one man that hid his talent, where will we find that man? We will find that man in the element of people somewhere along the line that has heard Brother Branham's message. They are made to believe they are in the bride, but somewhere along the line, as they purpose to be in the bride, something has happened that has took the gift and caused them to bury it They've shut it away because they're made to believe it's not needed. I'm ashamed to do anything if I was to make a mistake. At the same time, that goes on. Keep in mind, brothers and sisters, the Spirit of God who does the distribution of gifts, look out there in the terror realm where the foolish virgins are at yet today and where we see the terror realm at. Out there in the charismatic realm, brothers and sisters, God has absolutely distributed a certain measurement of Himself. And I'll say this tonight. He is that Spirit. So since He is that Spirit, He's got a right to do with Himself what He pleases to do. Because He knows those people potentially have been given their invitation. But they are the element of that which is called through the gospel that was potentially never the elect at all. But nevertheless, they were given the call through the gospel. They responded in a sense in that measure. They were convicted of their sins. But somewhere along the line, the devil was allowed to project and bring that kind of a people along always as a counterfeit and a scarecrow to really where the real are at. So as we see those high class preachers out there, you have to realize, brothers and sisters, 
while you see one cut of a man burying his talent, you see another one out there, brothers and sisters. Oh, my, my, my. If you could just turn Trinity Broadcast on right now. Here they are praying, and there's 5,000 people in that crowd. And they've got a prayer line of going here, and they've got uh, their hands on people. They're a prophesying, and they're going to and all of this stuff. I'm not making fun. I'm plainly telling you how the parable is applied. No. The man who hit his talent ain't out there. He's using his. How many catch the picture? You've got to keep in mind, brothers and sisters, all the same time in one area of this religious world, you've got the individual, somehow or other, who falls under a category of people. That's where the bride is being dealt with. There you have the individual hiding his talent. Potentially, then, who is he? He's a tear to start with. Is that a fact, Brother Jackson? I said he's a tear to start with. Because God don't call and eject a predestined seed to his. Keep in mind, every scripture in the Bible has to fulfill itself in a category of people. What did Jesus say in St. John chapter 6? No man can come to me except the Father, the Spirit, draw him. Isn't that right? That points to us predestination. And we can say this, it's the foreknowledge of God that does that. Jesus picks it up and again says, And all that the Father giveth me, predestined, chosen in Christ, shall come to me, and I will raise him up at the last day. But since we do know, brothers and sisters, that while the church is going through time and in this world, these parables brings out how that these parables show the Spirit of God and how Satan and certain things are fulfilled through time, then we can see, brothers and sisters, once the tear gets in, then in each age and hour of time, the tear will react to certain things as the Spirit of God moves. But that which is really predestined, they will react always the way God has potentially ordained it to be. You don't never make the predestined children of God doing the things to be rejected in the end. Because we're living right now, brothers and sisters, when God is separating all of this mixture of stuff. And therefore, you take that portion of the parable that brings out the negative, that brings out the unprofitable servant, and keep in mind, just as I said last Sunday night, when the hour of separation and judgment really is pronounced, that man is referred to as an unprofitable servant, isn't he? Look at the parable. Don't tell me that was what was spoke to him over here to begin the millennium. That part's all over. That's how he's been dealt with right here. As God does speak to the elect and separating that tear element away, purifying the bride, the bride brothers and sisters go up. It leaves two elements of people of the church world here. Number one, it's the foolish virgins. That's of the parable of the five wise and foolish. But then, brothers and sisters, according then to the second parable of Matthew 13, in the end of the harvest is where the tares are separated, so it leaves the tares here for the dark tribulation hour. And the dark tribulation hour is closed with the terrible onslaught of God's judgment and wrath, for now he will absolutely execute his wrath, and he seeks to destroy ungodly men and women. Therefore, the unprofitable servant and the unwise servant of Matthew 24. He's referred to as an evil servant. You can see, brothers and sisters, all of that which is referred to as evil, all of that which is referred to as unprofitable, it all falls in the category, it's a tear. And God leaves it here. But therefore, his anointing in the talent realm can fall on any element of this tear he wants to use. And 
That's why, brother, sister, in one category of people, he's afraid. Because it shows he's living where the Spirit works differently. More is required from him. But out here, brothers and sisters, they got no revelation. Really, they got little standard by how to judge or discern anything. And therefore, God can place an anointing on a person. And that's why you can see them preachers standing there shaking those people. And brothers and sisters, all kinds of things can go on. And they think they are doing the most wonderful, glorious work. They are doing a wonderful work. But they don't realize what they're getting is the rejects of God. I wouldn't want to be in it, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> this is why, brothers and sisters, tonight, when we see these parables in this light, we are living in an hour when the Spirit of God is dealing with people. He's creating, sometimes in our homes, sometimes where we work, sometimes in an environment that affects us inwardly, spiritually. And sooner or later, that begins to propel you and me to choose a walk, a category of people, by how we identify ourselves. And that's why, brothers and sisters, I have to say tonight, as we walk with God in these closing days of time, I have to believe, brothers and sisters, it's not because we personally are anything. We're no better in the flesh sense than those people out there. But somehow or other, God foreknew. Therefore, he's so fit to deal with this in a way. Because in us was a desire to be able to live and walk with him in the light, having a picture of the condition and understanding the hour we live in. And that bride people, which are the elect, they're the chosen, they're the wise, they're the faithful. They're the ones that somehow or other, when everything else is going to miss, they seem to see exactly, sooner or later, what to do. So, brothers and sisters, I'm going to endeavor to bring this thing now to a climax. In one realm of people, you got an unfaithful servant, unprofitable, he both goes and hides. But on the other hand, you've got much the same kind of a person. He don't need to hide it. So God just lets him go ahead and use it. But what does it produce? When he has come to the finish of all of this, somehow the Spirit deals with him. And when that individual begins to wake up and realize, Lord, why have you rejected me? Now, see, a lot of people can't understand that. They think this has got to be done by the person of Jesus. If it's got to be all done by the person of Jesus, then you have to realize then somewhere Jesus must be in a building down here, and sooner or later the foolish come knocking, Oh, please, Jesus, let me in. And he'll say, Depart from me. Now, he didn't say, You workers of iniquity. He just says, Depart from me. I know you not. Nobody's ever going to hear them words said in the natural. How many realize that? It's how the Spirit deals and applies that kind of authoritative statement to accomplish the result. So one of these days when the rapture has taken place, I have to say, brothers and sisters, I wouldn't want to be here and see what sets in in this world of religion. When people suddenly begin to realize something's gone wrong, something's a mess, don't tell me there's not somebody in the religious world who's going to realize somebody's missing, something's gone. Because when God has took his prime product, don't tell me he's going to leave everything fancy and rosy for Trinity Broadcast. Sure, it'll continue on, but I'll have to say there's going to be so much misgiving. Only a blind man and a deaf person could enjoy even cooperating with it. So here's one tear over here. He's just prophesying. He's casting out devils. Why all of this looks so wonderful. That's going to be his excuse and his alibi. But Lord, look. Look what I've 
done. Yes, but look what he turned away from. Look what was taken away from him. Keep in mind, it all is hinging on the fact. Take heed to what you hear. Now that same guy right there heard something that he could have put him right where you and I are at. Don't tell me he's got the written word. And there's been enough going on into this world, brothers and sisters, in the last 30 years. They've heard about these things. But they would rather give their ear to evil reports that the man that you and I will follow and listen to. He went off on the deep end. So that justifies their bye-bye. And there they go. And the minute they choose that, God took away from them potentially every benefit. That's really in the scripture. So there they are after. No revelation at all. They think they have, but they don't. They're intellectual. They can quote history. They can quote the Bible and all of this. But they can't put the picture together, brothers and sisters, to save their life. So therefore, they're not putting emphasis upon that. They're putting emphasis upon the fact, oh, look what we're doing for Jesus. And look at the hundreds and thousands that sits there awestruck over just watching that. Because brothers and sisters, there are tares ministering to more tares to collect and gather all of that and put it in its place. That's why brothers and sisters, we can say this. There are blind leaders leading the blind. There are not blind leaders leading, leading the predestined people. It is wise servants it is wise men with eyes to see and ears to hear that's leading the wise people, the children of God. So I hope you understand, brothers and sisters, there's a man with a calling. Look where he's at. Look what he's doing with it. God knew exactly, brothers and sisters, what he was before he even called him. But at the same time, here's one over on this side. God knew what he was before he even called him. And there you see gifts out there. You see callings out there. You see gifts on this side. You see callings on this side. It all goes right back then to Romans 11. We see, therefore, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God don't have to wait, brothers and sisters, till we're done saved and we've done proved ourselves to be something worthwhile before he makes up his mind. Well, I think I'll use that guy. <laughs> he already seen what was in us, brothers and sisters. So my point is tonight, brothers and sisters, by the time we, the bride, have reached this hour, she's done pass through, she's done seen all of this, she's seen how it's applied, she sees the condition it's produced in the religious world, and she's going to be so glad she is the chosen. She's going to be so glad that she is that people that has been given this fine linen, the righteousness of saints. And one of these days, she's going to be called to glory. She's going to be wise enough that with what God has gave her, she has made herself ready. So, brothers and sisters, we started out a few years ago. We didn't have a whole lot. But he gave us something. Will you agree with me? He gave us something. And that something was enough that it was an invitation. Come. There's greater things yet than this. And so as we respond, as we listen, little by little, He has guided us along the way. He has caused our footsteps to be directed of Him. We can see more now, brothers and sisters, than we did 20 years ago. We see the Scriptures now more in clarity than we did 20 years ago. All of this lets us know, brothers and sisters, somewhere we're just right at the threshold. But look at that poor picture out there. I have to say, all the potential reward they could have had is going to be given to the wise. And I have to say, it's not because we're worthy. It's because he loved us. And he knew, brothers and sisters, that you and I would choose the best. So I say tonight, thank God. He didn't have to do it, but he did it. He can do as he pleases anytime he wants to. He just asks you and us to have an ear to hear. Because to him that hath shall more be given. Given what? Of the same. 
And I have to say, of the same, it just means as long as we're here, as long as it's needful, there is a little understanding of something inside this book. God intends, us, intends to let us see that. Because that is what helps us, fortifies us, strengthens us, encourages us. While the world would laugh at us and think we're just a bunch of misfits, we can rejoice in our heart knowing we are the children that's predestined to be the bride of Christ. That don't make you bragging. It don't make you running up and down the street like kids at school. I'm glad I got it and you ain't got nothing. Did you ever see kids act like that? Well, I have. Boy, that irks you, don't it? God don't want us acting like that. I just feel sorry sometimes for people that's so caught up in all of this man-made show stuff out there. When you know good and well, brother and sister, it don't lead them to nothing. And you look at yourself and you can't help but say, thank you, Lord. When you rejoice over the fact you see the beautiful picture of serpent seed, they think you are playing with a snake. <laughs> Figurative speaking, they think you've gone loco and you're playing with a snake. They don't know it. They've done been swallowed by the biggest one that's ever been. So with that, brothers and sisters, I just pray that God will bless you. Heavenly Father, tonight, may you take these words and, Lord, put a picture together. Give us an understanding, Lord, how to see the hour of time we live in. Because truly, Lord, we're living in an hour. We know it's close, Lord. We can see it in the world about us. We see Israel, O oh Lord, right at the threshold of something. Therefore, Lord, we cannot help but pray. Lord, we pray for Jerusalem tonight. For the eventual hour and day when there will be peace in that city. And now, Lord, guide us in the days to come. I thank you for thy mercy, Lord, in my life. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now I want to just state a little thing here. Take this completely off of the tape.